Hey, thank you. Thank you, Carlos, for the introduction. Good afternoon. I'm going to speak in English because Carlos told me to, to do so. If you want, I can uh, reply to your questions later on in Spanish. I'm going to speak a little bit about automotive smart sensors uh, interfaces. Uh, first, a brief introduction and some challenges that we have in automotive electronics. Then I will uh, focus on a particular example a contactless potentiometer for automotive that may be a good illustration of the typical problems and challenges you find in this kind of systems and finally some conclusions. Uh, maybe you know automotive electronics is one of the markets for sensors electronics that is the most uh, relevant ones in, in terms of, uh, of sales and sales, sales volume but it's also very demanding so there's an opportunity and there is a challenge in, in automotive electronics. This is one of the big markets for sensors and for, for electronics. Nowadays, in a typical car, we have more than 100 embedded uh, systems involving electronic control units, a lot of sensors, actuators, and so on. And about 30, more than 30% of the total cost of a typical car is due to electronics. And this is going, is increasing uh, very fast. And now that we are going to electrical cars that are also autonomous cars, so this trend is going up uh, very fast. So the, the importance of electronics in automotive is really uh, high in today. This is just some illustration about that. This is the typical percentage of the cost of the car uh, in terms of electronics. Now uh, we are going fast to 50% of the total cost, so the relevance of electronics is huge. And this is just showing the, the growth of uh, the electronics that are, is uh, aimed to, to automotive applications compared to other relevant markets like industrial, medical, communications, consumer markets. You can see that they're growing. This is one of the most uh, growing, fastest growing markets in, in electronics. So which are the particular features and the problems we have in automotive electronics and challenges? Uh, this is not uh, a very, uh, it's not a simple market in order to do uh, electronic design. Uh, for instance, consumer electronics is much more simple if you want to go for, for that in your electronic products. For automotive electronics, there are some features that are really make things complicated, but at the same time, the market is very attractive for companies. For instance, one of the problems is the cost and the time to market. Typically, your benefit is, is, is kept very small because there are so many suppliers uh, in this market that normally you have to be very aggressive in terms of, of prices in order to have some uh, opportunity in the market. So you have to work with low margins and you have to sell a lot in order to have opportunities. So that's why typically most of the providers have a large part of the market because they are aggressive in terms of cost so that they can afford to, to go to this market with low prices, low cost. Another problem is the time to market. Typically, uh, if your product is not reaching the market in about one year, the, the amount of uh, the volume that you are going to be able to, to sell is much lower because the, the innovation goes very fast so yeah, you have to deliver your product to the market very soon in order to, to, to be able to take a, a large part of the market. So that's another problem. Other problems are related to quality and security. Typically, the quality level, the quality standards that you need in automotive electronics is at much higher, particularly for critical systems, for instance, systems that are in the engine, around the engine, and so on. So that's complicates things. And also, um, um, standards uh, related to security are very, very strict. So it's difficult to meet these standards uh, in, in the systems you are doing. Another issue is that uh, normally electronics in the car is, is uh, powered by the battery. And the battery is not a very good power source because uh, the voltage of the battery is quite high and it's not stable. For instance, when you, you uh, start the, the, the engine of the car, the, the, there are some transients in the battery voltage and your systems 
must be able to handle, to, to live with these problems, with these disturbances with the power supply. And also uh, the temperature range that uh, you may have is very, very high. For instance, typically for, for uh, in uh, specifications for CAD electronics, you, your electronic system must be able to operate from minus 40 to 120 degrees. And that's very complicated in order to, to, be, to have a functional system in this high temperature range. Another issue is that uh, electronic, electromagnetic compatibility issues and interferences are very high normally in particularly around the engine. So that complicates things. The, the standards you have to meet in terms of electromagnetic compatibility are very high. So that complicates the design, not only the design of the electronics, but also the design of the mechanical uh, system of the embodiment, the shielding and so on. So, in summary, this is a market that is very attractive, but this is very dif difficult at the same time. So we are going to see an example of a smart uh, sensor interface that is widely used in, in uh, automotive electronics, but it's also used in other fields, like for instance, industrial applications, medical uh, electronics, and so on. And this is the, uh, the contactless potentiometer. Uh, in several uh, applications, you need to detect angles with high accuracy. For that, in many uh, cases, you can use the normal, the conventional potentiometer that is uh, the cheap uh, uh, sweep uh, wipe potentiometer that is very, uh, very cheap and it's having internal, uh, internal friction creates a problem in several applications because the conventional potentiometer is, uh, is, uh, it has a lifetime that is limited. When you are using the potentiometer, for instance, in consumer electronics, for instance, in an electronic appliance, for instance, in a washing machine, if you are using the potentiometer in order to implement a knob, this is going to last more or less like the, the electronic uh, appliance because typically, how many times are you going to wash your clothes? Twice a day, once a day. So the potential impetus is going to be able to, 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 uh, to have an unexpected lifetime of years, and this is not really a problem. But what happens, for instance, when you have the potential meter inside a car, inside the engine of a car? If, the, if this potential meter is working all the time, typically in a few months, the potential meter is going to be broken. And the cost of repairing this potentiometer, if you have to open the engine and replace the potentiometer is going to be very, very high. So in these applications, normally it's better to have a potentiometer without internal contact so that the lifetime is much higher. And also at the same time, the accuracy is much higher. So in this kind of applications, typically contactless potentiometers are used nowadays in order to replace the conventional potentiometers because it is much more cost effective. This is particularly useful in automotive electronics, where this kind of potentiometers are uh, used quite often. You have different, you may have different uh, options in order to implement these potentiometers that that uh, rely on different sensors. You may use for detecting the angle and also for different uh, electronics in order to interface the sensors. In particular, for the electronics, typically we go for an ASIC in CMOS technologies with different. Uh, implementation uh, options. That gives uh, room to different cost to performance trade-offs depending on what you are looking for for that. This is just an example of typical applications inside the car for contactless potentiometer where you have to, to, to measure to detect the angle with high accuracy. For instance, for in the, at the engine, you can uh, measure the crankshaft rotational mo uh, motion, the camshaft rotational motion, the exhaust gas recirculation, for instance, on throttle position, gear shift position, and so on, for the transmission, also for several applications, and in the body of the car, also for, in order to control the position of the of the seat and for navigation, for instance, for in order to detect the position of the wheel, or for the ve vehicle yaw rate. For instance, also in security for vehicle tilt or for anti theft, if someone is moving the, the car and, the, and you have to detect this uh, situation, you can use contactless potentiometer. And also in the braking system, in the lightning system, for instance, in order to level automatically the headlamps, 
and for steering, for instance, for the steering wheel and inside the vehicle for many other applications like, for instance, the mirror positioning, wiper positioning, etc. So there are so many uh, applications inside the car where you have to measure the angle that this kind of, uh, of devices is very useful in many of, of these places. For instance, this example is a contactless potentiometer what, that was developed here. The chip, the sensor interface was designed uh, here, the Pali University of Navarra. The sensor is provided by Infineon and the foundry in order to fabricate the chip is AMS in Austria. The customer is the Megit group that has a facility in uh, Tudela, this Nacesa, Pierre Nacesa. Pierre made the valid did the validation of the design. So this is, these are the specifications of this contactless potentiometer, the specifications that we agreed with the, with Megit. With, uh, I'm just going to go to, to the most relevant specifications. The most difficult one probably is the uh, operating temperature. The, the system must be able to operate from minus 40 degrees to 120 degrees. That's very difficult to make the electronics operate with enough accuracy in this extreme temperature. So that's one of the most difficult things. Typically in automotive electronics, the output is normally provided in PWM, PWM pulse width modulation format so that the sensors, the smart sensors can send the information to the electronic control units in a way that is robust against interferences and all kind of, uh, of uh, issues that happen in near the engine. So that's quite common. In this case, the system is also able to provide uh, the output in analog form. And resolution is 10 bits. That is quite common also for contactless potentiometers for car applications. And also the supply voltage is maybe uh, the supply that comes from the battery, but at the same time, the customer wanted to, to be able to have a chip that was able to operate in normal consumer electronics with five volts power supply. That's why we have two kinds of power supplies. The power consumption must be below 25 milliamps. And uh, this is another feature, the typical feature of automotive electronics. The standards for electromagnetic compatibility, electricity LS, discharge is quite, uh, quite uh, hard. In order to Another feature that is uh, difficult to reach is the package size. I mean, the total size for the electronics is 24 millimeters. So that uh, complicates things when you try to, to do this, this circuit. And uh, we decided to use for the sensor, a GMR uh, sensor bridge. I will uh, tell you uh, later on. So that's the idea. This is the contactless potentiometer. You have the axis, the axis is moving and uh, attached to the axis, there's a permanent magnet that is moving with the, the axis. And then inside the potentiometer, there is a sensor that is in red here that is able to detect the direction of the magnetic field. And then there is an, a chip, there is an ASIC here in blue that is able to process the signal from the sensor and provide the, the reading of the of the angle to the electronic uh, control unit inside the car. So what is the main problem here? The main problem is that inside the potentiometer you have a PCB of 20 millimeters. It's only this size. So it's very complicated to, to uh, implement complex hardware in two centimeters. So the only options you have is to uh, fabricate a chip that contains all the electronics. Otherwise it's not possible with commercial components to place all the electronic components you need in this small size. So the requirement is for uh, doing a chip, an ASIC, in order to implement the electronics for the sensor interface. Another uh, uh, feature that is uh, typical, not only for contactless protection meters, but in general for automotive electronics is that the number of parts that you typically sell is very high because the market is very high. So in this case, only for this customer, the estimated uh, sales were more than 1 million devices every year. And the cost, the unit cost is more or less 15 euro. These figures uh, allow to use an ASIC uh, solution for that. Because if you fabricate a chip for your sensor interface, in order to be 
cost effective, this solution, you need to sell a lot of, of uh, units. If you are only doing prototyping with say 100 or even 10, 10 1000, 10,000 uh, parts, this is not, not going to be effective in terms of cost because the investment that you need for in order to fabricate a chip is very high. So if you don't, if you are not going to sell in millions your certain interfaces, this is not going to be cost effective. You have to imagine that if you want to implement an ASIC for your solution, you have to be ready to spend, say, 150,000 euros, more or less, or up to 2,000, uh, 200,000 euros only for the design. Then you have to go for the manufacturing, but it's very expensive to, to, to make a chip in order to, to fabricate a sensor interface instead of going to commercial solutions. But if the volume of sales is justifies it, so that's a good solution. In any case, uh, this market, the automotive sector is very cost sensitive. So you have to try to minimize cost. And that means go, going for an ASIC solution, so fabricating a chip for the electronics. You have to sell this chip in millions of units because the, the more units you sell, the lower the, the unit cost for chips. This is a typical, uh, it, the, the cost scales with the number of, of, of units. So it's very important to fabricate as many chips as possible in order to decrease the unit cost and also to minimize the number of external components to the chip because these external components increase the cost very much. I mean, for instance, if you need to include an external resistor in, in the PCB that is outside the chip, this is going to increase the cost in a few cents of euro. That it seems that this is not too much, but if you are going to sell millions of, of contactless potentiometers, this is going to have an impact on cost. But if the same resistor is inside the chip, the, chip, the increasing cost of the chip is almost negligible. So the, the option is trying to integrate as much as possible inside the chip, not only because of the cost, also because of the performance. Uh, uh, when the component is inside the chip, the performance is better and the reliability is, is higher because you don't have the typical failures due to bad soldering and so, so all these things. So the idea is trying to integrate as much as possible inside the chip here. So that was the idea. We did two designs. We fabricated the, the contactless potentiometer in the conventional case that is typically for consumer electronics and another case that is sealed and is shielded in order to uh, be able to, to work near the engine of the car. And that was mainly for the automotive electronics market. And this is what I was telling you before the, the way the, the sensor operates with the permanent magnet that is attached to the axis and then the magnet, the magnetic uh, sensor here. In this case, we used a magnetoresistive sensor uh, and then we fabricated the AC. So there are many sensors that are available in order to make contactless potentiometers. Some of them are optical sensors, some of them are capacitive sensors, some of them are inductive sensors, but the most typical ones in automotive electronics are Hall effect uh, sensors. Our, an array of sensors is placed in a typically in a circle, and this way you can detect the direction of the magnetic field. This is a quite common solution in industry, but it's not the best one. Nowadays, different kind of magnetic detection is, is used. For instance, you have magnetotransistors and magpets in order to detect the, the magnetic field. Uh, but probably the best solution is using some kind of ma magnetoresistors. Among the magnetoresistors, two typical ones are what is called an isotropic magnetoresistive sensor or AMRs and giant magnetoresistive sensors, GMRs. In our case, we use GMRs because they have two main advantages. The first one is that sensitivity is very high. That's why they are named giant. And the second uh, advantage is that these sensors uh, are sensitive to the direction of the magnetic field, but they are not very sensitive to the intensity of the magnetic field. That means that you get the same output for a given uh, magnetic field uh, 
in a window of intensities. So you are able to detect only the direction and this measurement is not very influenced by the particular intensity of the magnetic field. Why is this so important? Because that simplifies a lot the mechanical assembly of the potentiometer. So because for instance, the distance between the sensor and the magnet is not so important. It can change by a few millimeters because the sensor is very insensitive to the intensity of the magnetic field. And that simplifies the assembly. So the mechanical part of the contact potentiometer can be done with a much more tolerance and that decreases a lot the cost of the mechanical assembly. So that's a huge advantage. And that's the main advantage of this kind of sensor. That's why we use this kind of sensors in order to simplify the, the assembly of the final potentiometer. In particular, we used uh, a GMR sensor from Infineon uh, that is using is in uh, is marketed as a bridge. There are two kinds of bridges: the B6 and C6. We use the B6. It has four GMRs, giant magnet resistors with uh, different uh, sensitivity to the direction of the magnetic field. And I'm not going to go into the detail of the sensor, but what you get at the output is an output voltage here that is uh, related to the direction of the magnetic field in a sinusoidal shape. So if you see the, the voltage at the output of the bridge versus the angle of the magnetic field, you get this kind of outputs, sinusoid. So uh, this is the, the, the sensor we used for, for, the, for this system. This is a microphotograph of the sensor bridge. You can see the four magnetoresistive sensors here. And this is the real output, the amplified response of four of these sensors. You can see that there are some problems. I mean, uh, the first one is the sensitivity from sensor to sensor is changing. Also the temperature dependence of the sensors is important. It's, it's not uh, seen here because we are at a fixed temperature, but if you change temperature, the sensitivity is changing. And you can see also that there are two kinds of offsets. There is some electrical offset because the the offset, the DC level is different from sensor to sensor, but there is also a mechanical offset because the reference level is not at the same value of the angle. So you have to solve for both offsets. So the output of the sensor is not uh, useful by itself. You have to compensate from electrical offset, mechanical offset, sensitivity from sensor to sensor, non-linearity because the output is non-linear and the, for the temperature dependence. So there are many things to do before having a accurate uh, reading of the of the angle. And this is what is done, done with the chip. This is the ASIC that was fabricated in order to interface the sensor. The ASIC has many C things. I'm going to just to describe a few of them. We have internally a voltage regulator in order to, to generate a stable supply of five volts from the battery uh, power supply. We also have the sensor biasing inside the chip so that we uh, decrease cost. So we supply a fixed current to the sensor bridge. And then uh, we have a, a programmable gain, gain amplifier in order to interface the sensor, in order to amplify the signal from the sensor and A to D conversion. And then in the digital part, most of the processing is done in the digital domain. After that, we have an output driver in order to generate the PWM output. And if you want to generate the output in analog form, we have, have an extra digital to analog converter. We generate internally all the bias current and voltages with an internal uh, bias uh, generator that is based on an external resistance. The value of the external resistance is setting all the bias uh, voltage and currents. We have an internal code generator. We have an EEPROM, internal EEPROM, that is uh, storing all the calibration data and is programming the chip. The EEPROM is using a particular technology for automotive electronics that is fuse prom that is typically uh, used in AMS, AMS for, for automotive electronics. This is basically the, the chip. This is just uh, for curiosity, the programmable sensor biasing. So the sensor biasing here, we are using a current mirror in order to supply the, the proper current with a programmable output so that, so that these switches are activated with some EEPROM bits so that you can program the, the current to the bridge from two to four milliamps. We are using the bootstrap in technique in order to improve accuracy of the sensor biasing. 
in order to do the programmable uh, gain amplifier, we are using a typical uh, instrumentation amplifier like this with programmable resistors. This is the, the equation that corresponds to the output. You can control the offset using this bias voltage here. And this is the final implementation where we are using programmable resistors that are controlled by switches. The switches are controlled at, by EEPROM uh, bits so that you can program up to 16 values of gain. These are the values that you can program by switching properly these resistors. And you can control the offset using a value that is stored in digital at the apron, this digital value that is stored in the apron is applied to a digital to analog converter so that you get the analog value that you need here in order to compensate for the offset. We are using our, uh, our original technique for offset compensation that is shown here. You, can re you have to remember that one of the main goals in this chip implementation is to minimize cost. In order to minimize cost in a chip, you have to use a chip technology. I mean, uh, um, um, the technology that, that is not very expensive, a CMOS technology, the conventional CMOS technology is the cheapest one. And you also have to minimize the area of the chip because the silicon area translates directly to the cost. So we have to minimize the area. How can you minimize area? By reusing the blocks. So we are trying to reuse all the blocks inside the chip in order to be able to minimize area. Uh, this typically when you are doing sensor interfacing for most of these sensors, for instance, for these magnetic sensors, the bandwidth that you require is very low. So the sensors uh, have, have to be sampled at uh, relatively low sampling frequencies. So you have a lot of time in order to do the processing of the sensor signal. So you, have, you can benefit from this because you can uh, reuse your uh, circuits because you have more time in order to do the processing. If you need to process the signal in, in a very fast way, you need to uh, do more things in parallel in hardware. But if you have time in order to do the processing, you can to use a sequential solution so reusing hardware. And this is what we are doing here. We have, for instance, the, the amplifier, and we have also at the output of the amplifier and a, uh, analog to digital converter. This A to D converter is a typical SAR, successive approximation resistor A to D converter. This is shown here with a comparator, a digital to analog converter and the SAR resistor. What we are doing is just doing using the, the SAR resistor for two uh, things. The first thing is as part of the analog to digital converter, but the second part is doing using it for offset compensation. Uh, what we are doing is to use this part of the analog to digital converter, the digital to analog converter, and the SAR, these blocks here for offset compensation. So we are not using an extra digital to analog converter. We are using the same digital to analog converter from the ADC in order to do the offset compensation. At the beginning, we close this input so we can sense the offset and we store the offset. Uh, and then we can apply the offset here. We open this and we apply the, 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 uh, the compensation, the offset compensation here. Because before sampling the, the signal, we don't need the, the A to the converter. So we are using this part of the A to the converter in order to compensate this offset. And when the offset is compensated, then the A to the conversion starts. And then we are using these blocks for A to the conversion. So we are reusing these blocks in order to simplify the, the processing. For the digital part, we are using the same idea. We are reusing all the blocks so that we can minimize area. And the price that we pay is to increase the processing time, but we have enough uh, time in order to do the processing. So we are re reusing logic a lot. And the digital part, for instance, makes offset compensation, fine compensation of gain, thermal drift, linearization, the compensation of the zero reference, that is the mechanical offset compensation. Also, we are doing our averaging and range adjustment and PWM generation. So most of the, of the processing is done in digital. This is the architecture of the digital part that is very simple. We have a bus of 10 bits, and we just have a few registers and, and other and subtractor. And we don't need many more things than this. Also, a, li a combinational a linearizer, not to linearize the sinusoid, and a very simple control unit. And that's all. We don't need to use 
complex uh, microcontrollers and so on, because uh, we are using all the time the same sequence of operations. For instance, if you need to multiply, you can do the, mul the multiplication by successive additions and uh, levels uh, and shifting in a shift register, and we are using that. This is the final chip with an area of only 6.9 square millimeters and involving all the signs. This is the final PCB. This side has a GMR sensor bridge and the other side has the ASIC that we implemented. And this is the procedure we follow for calibration. We are using a motor in, uh, in order to rotate the, the magnet. Then we are calibrating the sensor bridge. We uh, get the, the reading to the PC and from that we are evaluating the parameters, the, the, the data stream that we have to, to uh, program to the EEPROM in the ASIC. This is the, the calibration program. We measure the output and we make the best sinusoidal fit to the output. And from this, we get the bits that we have to program to the EEPROM in order to calibrate the, the chip. This is finally the reading of the PWM output versus the ideal one. The, Theoretical one is in blue, the experimental one is in red after calibration, and for the range of angles that we wanted to measure, the, the accuracy is enough, is uh, the one that we were uh, estimating. So as a conclusion, automotive electronics is a very relevant market for electronics and for sensors, but it's a very challenging one due to the requirements. And depending on the application, you, different kind of uh, electronic implementation may be useful for, for that. So thank you very much. I don't know if you have any questions. As, as Alain was uh, telling before, uh, here we uh, are working on uh, micro, uh, small sensor interfaces, micro ASIC design. So if you are interested in this kind of things, we are also hiring, we are looking for people that is interested for doing PhD, uh, for doing master degree, uh, final projects and so on. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Lopez, for your talk. Very interesting talk. So applied research that is also interesting for all of us as engineers. I'm sorry, but we, have, we are running out of time. We are quite late. Uh, we have uh, our last talk before lunch, uh, so we will proceed to the next speaker. Thank you for your sure. presentation.